Uh, so today is uh, Monday, December, December 7th. This is the third day of our uh, 2020 Rohatsu session, uh, our Zoom session at Endless Path Zendo, uh, which we are doing in combination with the Toronto Zen Center, uh, the Vermont Zen Center, which is hosting this, and the uh, Casa Zen uh, in uh, San Jose, uh, Costa Rica, plus of course, Endless Path. Uh, so uh, this morning, because this is Rohatsu, which commemorates and embodies the Buddha's great enlightenment 2,500 years ago, uh, we will continue with uh, a Teisho connected with the Buddha. Uh, and uh, today, uh, we will uh, take a look uh, at a uh, koan that connects with the life of the Buddha. Uh, so we did uh, the Buddha's leaving home, and we did um, a te show on the Buddha's enlightenment in preparation for tomorrow's ceremony, uh, which, by the way, that will be at the Vermont link, not the Endless Path link uh, with our Zoom. Uh, for tomorrow's uh, ceremony instead of Teisho. And today we move from Tathagata Zen uh, to ancestral Zen. That is from the Buddha himself to the beginning of the line of transmitted teachers. Uh, the road goes on after enlightenment. Uh, and uh, we'll take a look at that today. Uh, we'll start with uh, case number six in the Wu Men Kuang the Mumen Khan in Japanese or gateless barrier uh, in English. Uh, the Buddha holds up a flower. The case goes like this. Once in ancient times, when the world honored one was at Mount uh, Gridrakuta, he held up a flower before his assembled disciples. At this, all were silent. Only Mahakashapa broke into a smile. The world honored one said, I have the all pervading eye of the true Dharma, the subtle mind of incomparable nirvana, the true form of formless form and the flawless gate of the supreme teaching. It is not established upon words and phrases and is transmitted outside all teachings, I now entrust this to Mahakashapa. Uh, then Wu Men's uh, Mumon in Japanese commentary. Golden-faced Gotama is certainly outrageous. He turns the noble into the lowly, sells dog flesh advertised as mutton, as if it were so wonderful. However, Suppose that all the monks had smiled. How would the all-pervading eye of the true Dharma have been transmitted? Or suppose that Mahakashapa had not smiled. How could he have been entrusted with it? If you say the true Dharma can be transmitted, the golden-faced old man with his loud voice deceived the simple villagers. If you say the true Dharma can't be transmitted, why did the Buddha say that he, he entrusted it to Mahakashapa? Woman's verse, holding up a flower, the snake shows its tail. Mahakashapa breaks into a smile, and people and devas are at a loss. So a note, uh, Vulture Peak uh, is Mount Gridrakuta, was one of the Buddha's favorite places for teaching. It's near Rajgir or Rajagaha. Uh, is, I think uh, one of them is the newer version of that name in Bihar, India. Uh, so to start, here we have another minimalist, minimalist gesture as teaching by the Buddha uh, on uh, um, 
on, on yesterday or uh, yesterday in Tesho, we looked at touching the earth. So he made one very simple gesture when uh, challenged by Mara, he touched the earth. Here, he just holds up a flower. Uh, these minimalist gestures uh, may be minimalist, yet each one changes the potential of countless beings. Uh, now, the Buddha had a choice immediately after his great enlightenment. He could stay where and as he was, enjoying the bliss, freedom, and insight of his attainment. And indeed, according to legend, he was sorely tempted to do just that. Or he could deal with what his insight had brought him and set his whole being toward the impossible, even absurd task of saving the countless already saved, but immensely deluded, and so still suffering beings. It was not an easy choice, even for the Buddha. And he did not rise to it all at once. First, he sat beneath the tree, just continued there for about three weeks, totally absorbed in relief, liberation, joy, the empty, bottomless mind returned home, flooded with insight after insight. A furious storm arose, and as he hardly seemed to even notice, the natural world responded for him. A great Naga serpent being rose up out of the earth, and spreading its cobra hood over the seated Buddha, swayed above him, protecting him from the fury of wind and rain. And yet, in the midst of all that great joy and freedom, the newly realized Buddha was also working on a problem. Could the reality of what he'd seen and now lived within be grasped? Could he or anyone teach it? It was perfect and whole before the first thought arose. It was what was from the beginning. Would anyone get it? Could they? No, it seemed impossible. The truth was so open and clear, it could simply not be grasped. Teaching, or so it seemed just then, would be absurd. In time, everyone would have to find their own way to where they already really were and awake to it on their own. That was what seemed truest. There was nothing to gain and no suffering beings to gain it. So why teach? All things were as they perfectly and eternally were. Was there anything to say or do? There was no way to get to it, no gate to open onto it. From the very beginning, it was already done. The gods intervened, reminding him that there were many whose eyes were only thinly clouded by the dust of delusion, and many others ready to see it through if only given half a chance. In short, the gods insisted that teaching was crucial, the pain of suffering beings great, and teaching really was a way to what he'd found and it could benefit countless numbers of beings, not just those alive then, but in the future as well. Legend also says that these same beings of higher realms, these devas or gods, had also intervened at the time of his home leaving. They had taken the forms of the sick, the old, and the dead people, and also of the truth seeker, all to provide the the karmically necessary trigger to the Buddha's quest for truth. And then they had graciously opened the locked palace doors, allowing Prince Siddhartha to make his necessary exit. When I think of the promptings of the gods in this legend, I cannot help but think of Lincoln and his angels of our better nature. From where do our deepest intuitions our mysterious promptings to do the greatest good despite risks to our own selves arise. How and why does this happen? 
for it does happen. And sometimes at the oddest moments and sometimes too, from the least likely seeming candidates. So the gods prompted him as only gods can and moved by their far seeing words, the newly awakened full Buddha got up from Zazen, left his quiet life beneath the Bodhi tree and reclaiming his ancient vows, shouldered his mission to not only attain the way, but to help all beings who in reality were already fully on it, awaken to it as well. Absurd, absurd, like filling a well with snow. And yet, and yet the gods hit the nail on the head. How could he just go off now and lead a simple solitary life roaming in ecstasy and liberation, unknown and unacknowledged? Through countless, countless lives, he had already made great vows, bodhisattva vows, and not just mouthed them either, but had taken them to heart and lived them as fully as possible. So now, because of this reminder of his own deepest intentions, these promptings of the angels of his better nature, he didn't settle down where he was, but he got up and went forward to teach. He didn't stay stuck beneath his beautiful tree. This act of teaching is known as turning the wheel of the Dharma. And because of his getting up and starting this back then, 2,500 years ago, we now have this practice, this session, this ongoing effort, this koan, and this flower. What trust, what faith in the audience, in the future, in all of us, there is in that one simple act of holding up a flower. He gave no explanations. He gave no directions. Like the ringing of a bell or the taste of tea or the wetness of water or the pain of a stubbed toe, there's just this flower. Who doesn't have the eyes to see? He's presenting the shout, which is the literal meaning of Teisho, not giving a lecture, and he's simultaneously probing the depth of the stream with a stick. Still, it must have seemed like an astonishing event at the time. Imagine this. The great teacher has come to enlighten the crowd to give a Dharma talk. And this being India, perhaps thousands of eager listeners are waiting expectantly to hear his wise and encouraging words. And what does he do? Saying nothing, he holds up a flower. I know I'd fear being misunderstood if I did that. I'd want to explain or at least give meaningful clues. And remember, this was a long time before holding up a flower had become a new age spiritual cliche. 2,500 years ago, it was radical. Thousands were there gathered for his Teisho. Would he offer another magnificent and astonishingly rich sutra for them to hear? Would he show miracles? He had done it before. Would he do it again now? Would the deathless gods themselves become visible? Would they descend from the skies to hang on to the great awakened teacher's sublime words? Would the Buddha maybe enlighten 10, 100, even a 1,000 people? The crowd waits with bated breath, expectations running high. The Buddha takes his seat, looks out over the crowd, and holds up a flower. Beethoven smiles and plays not a note. Shakespeare bows and walks off stage. What was the response to the great teachers holding up a flower? Was there disappointment? Was there dismay and confusion? Wu Men suggests that indeed there was all that. Was there nervous laughter? Quite possibly. Were there disagreements and arguments about the meaning of it? 
most likely. Might there even have been scattered shouts of charlatan were there brilliant and long-winded defenses of the great wisdom of the master by ardent followers? Could be. The pros and cons that followed from holding up a flower must have been quite a kettle of fish. In a sense, holding up that flower was a deep expression of faith, not just in the reality of his own insight, but faith in us, in everyone, in everything. Faith that even if no one got it just then, it would blossom in time. A flower was held up, but a seed was planted. And Mark Ashapa, well, he simply broke into a smile. And yet it was more than that and less. It was just a flower. That was it. That was all. The Buddha wasn't pointing to the future. There was no calculated design. There was and there is just a flower. Did anyone need faith to see it? If we have eyes, there it is. Did some think, is he saying we should be like this flower? Or is he asking us to consider the lilies of the field? Some in that crowd might have, and they might have benefited from such thoughts too. But Mahakashapa alone broke into a smile, cracked a smile, broke open. Man, it just really totally cracked him up. Why? What's going on? And why did Wu Men want us to explore this as a koan, not just take it as an article of faith or as a parable, as a koan, it is no longer legend or history, no longer simply the Buddha's or Makashapa's story. It is not a teaching, not something to believe in or be guided by or have faith in. It is simply ours, which means it becomes our responsibility to live it right now. The verse to the story of the Buddha's enlightenment in Denkoroku, Transmission of the Light, reads, one branch from the old plum tree extends blendedly forth, thorns come forth at the same time. One branch from the old plum tree extends splendidly forth, thorns come forth at the same time. For our present purposes, we can allow this to mean that the difficulty that arose has, fortunately, come all the way down to us. Without this flower, there would be no sashim, no you and me practicing realization today. The jumble of monks all at six and seven, says Wu Men in a verse in The Gateless Barrier, is all your fault, Bodhidharma. But actually, Bodhidharma was only carrying the fault forward to make sure it kept going. It all started much further back because it all actually goes back to the Buddha himself, that great troublemaker. As John Lewis said, never be shy about making good trouble. Our Dharma ancestors weren't. In short, no flower, no Zen. Without this very flower and Mahakashapa's smile, the Buddha would have passed into his nirvana and his collected teachings would have become memories, recollections, recollection, recollections enshrined in ceremony or gathering dust as consecrated texts. Instead, we have actual practice realization and ongoing transmission of a living way or path extending all the way to us and to our worries, our issues, our sleepless nights, our difficult times of environmental loss, injustice, misogyny, corruption, racism, and extreme political polarization. What was the Buddha thinking?
Can holding up a flower really help? Look at all that's now on our plate. If it can help, how will we each show this truth in our lives? How live it as this life? And how will we practice it? Not tomorrow, but today, this very moment. How will we crack a smile? Is there a way? Women's commentary. Golden face Gautama is certainly outrageous. He turns the noble into the lowly, sells dog flesh advertised as mutton as if it were so wonderful. However, suppose that all the monks had smiled, how would the all-pervading eye of the true Dharma been transmitted? Or suppose that Mahakashapa had not smiled, how could he have been entrusted with it? If you say the true Dharma can be transmitted, the golden-faced old man with his loud voice deceived the simple villagers. If you say the true Dharma can't be transmitted, why did the Buddha say that he entrusted it to Mahakashapa? So now get down to it. Well, let's get down to it. What is realization? And what is transmission? Woman is being very careful and really does want us to be clear. Non-duality, we might say, is the essence of intimacy or realization. Just this ouch, just this blue sky, no separated observer observing. The sky steps in and is me. The morning star steps in and is Buddha. Intimacy is that intimate. The caw of the crow sounds within my own heart. What other could there be? Okay, so then what is transmission? Does it differ from realization? If it didn't, then anyone who had some degree of insight would receive transmission. But that doesn't happen. That's not the way of it. The Buddha transmitted the all-pervading eye of the true Dharma to Mahakashapa alone. How come? Didn't others equally have original enlightenment, original mind? Isn't that what the Buddha himself realized and taught? Didn't he spontaneously exclaim at the time of his great insight, wonder of wonders, all beings are Buddha. So why does he now say that Mahakashapa alone has it? Plus, when it was duly transmitted to him, what did he get? Ananda, the Buddha's first cousin and attendant, he of perfect memory through whom all the Buddhist teshos, the sutras have come down to us, really wanted to know. <clears throat> Though he had attended the Buddha for many years, it said that his very affection and love for the Buddha kept him from going beyond him into his own understanding of what the Buddha actually taught. So now he was anxious and puzzled about this thing called transmission. What did Mahakashapa now have once he received it that Ananda himself didn't? So when the Buddha passed into his Pada Nirvana and Mahakashapa began leading the community, Ananda asked, what did you get with transmission? Wu Men case, 22, woman Kwan, rather, case 22, gateless barrier, or Mumen Kwan in Japanese, Mahakashapa's flagpole goes like this. Ananda asked Mahakashapa, the world honored one transmitted the golden robe to you. What else did he transmit to you? Mahakashapa said, Ananda, 
Ananda said, yes. Mahakashapa said, pull down the flagpole at the gate. Uh, Tesho completed. Uh, victory won. Pull down the flagpole at the gate. What is transmitted? I see your golden robe and I see the Buddha's bowl you now hold. But what's the real core of it? What did you get with transmission? Oh, that's a good question. What does anyone get? Danan Henry Roshi received the Dharma from Philip Kaplow Roshi and also from Robert Aitken Roshi. He then transmitted his Dharma to me, making me his heir. Are our minds telepathically linked? Do we think the same lofty thoughts? What was transmitted? According to Buddhist tradition in this world cycle, transmission began with Shakyamuni Buddha. There were previous world cycles and previous Buddhas. This might mean big bangs ago or simply literally world ages ago here on this earth or on other planets in our current universe. Uh, Buddhism has a particularly wide view of time and space. In any case, the legacy he passed on to Mahakashapa has been passed on to us through 2,500 years of realization and transmission. All of what we practice, all of how we've benefited from the practice comes from this transmission from the Buddha to Mahakashapa. In short, it comes from this flower but did it even really happen? Aiken Roshi raises this point in his Taisho on this case, uh, which appears in the book, Gateless Barrier, Aiken Roshi's uh, translations and commentaries on uh, the Gateless Barrier, Woman Kwan. He, he asks, would it make a difference if the Buddha never existed? And here's his answer. True religious practice is grounded in the non-historical fact of essential nature. The world honored one twirls a flower, Bai Chong's fox, and all the other fabulous cases of Zen literature are your stories and mine, intimate accounts of our own personal nature and experience. So, we can definitely answer it, in fact, definitively answer it. In short, it is happening right now. This is the moment in which the Buddha gives his Tesho, raises the flower, and the exact moment that Mahakashapa breaks into a smile. Here is where each distinct thing offers its truth. It is not far off in time or space. It is not back in ancient history, and it is not waiting for us off in our future. Though it may take a long time to see it. Case 100, Blue Cliff Record, Hekigan Roku, or the PN Lu in Chinese. Ba Ling, uh, Haryo in Japanese said, each branch of coral upholds the moon. Each branch of Carl upholds the moon. Regardless of where we're presently at, what's also true, what's, I'm sorry, what's also true is that each of us also, regardless of where we're at, has a legacy for good or ill that we will leave to future generations. This is inevitable. It is our footprint in time this legacy that each of us will leave to the future. What shall our legacy be? How will we craft it now? Ryokan, that unique Soto priest and poet and calligrapher and extraordinarily humble human being and teacher, whose temple along with Hakuin's place and Dogen's Eheiji was one of the three high points of our 2016 Japan pilgrimage, wrote, 
my legacy, what will it be? Flowers in spring, the cuckoo in summer, and the crimson maples of autumn. My legacy, what will it be? Flowers in spring, the cuckoo in summer, and the crimson maples of autumn. With the commentary, Wu Men's carefully chosen language brings us back home. Golden Face Gautama is certainly outrageous. In other words, come on down off your lofty pedestal, O Buddha. You're hawking cheap goods as if they were the high class stuff. But what are you really up to with your golden faced radiant countenance, your face shining as if lit by a morning star? A traditional epithet for the Buddha was that he was golden faced, possibly because he was a light skinned Nepali rather than a dark Southern Indian, as well as because of the radiance of his demeanor. Now, what if all the monks had smiled? Where there, uh, oh, would there have been no transmission at that point if everyone smiled? Uh, not just the monks, lay people, gods, animals, everyone gathered there. And what if Mahakashapa hadn't smiled? How would things have played out then? Does transmission even turn on such events, really? Can the true Dharma be transmitted? What is it after all? And how does it get passed on? And if it can't, is there some deception at work here? Is the myth a lie? Joseph Campbell, among others, pointed to myth as the highest state of language. It's as far into truth as words can go. Yet, Wu Men takes pains to downplay it. Golden-faced old man and simple villagers hardly seem like the stuff of legend. Where's the veneration and awe? I mean, if I ever go to Vulture Peak on pilgrimage, I'm going to feel awe and a tremendous sense of veneration. I might even be moved to tears. That kind of thing happened on our China pilgrimage. Deep feeling was touched. But here Wu Men is pointedly taking it all away. Why? Who is kidding whom? Maybe the verse will help. Wu Men's verse, holding up a flower. The snake shows its tail. Mahakashapa breaks into a smile and people and devas are at a loss. Holding up a flower, the snake shows its tail. Mahakashapa breaks into a smile and people and devas are at a loss. Holding up a flower, the, the snake shows its tail. Hey, wait a minute. The snake is all tail. Holding up a flower then, the whole deal, the whole nature, the whole mind, the whole character is exposed. Nothing's hidden. It's an open secret. In his Zazen Wasan, chant in praise of Zazen, Master Hakuin writes, what is there outside us? What is there we lack? Nirvana is openly shown to our eyes, not in the future. Openly shown means it's right now openly shown. How could it be hidden? Every branch of Carl upholds the moon. And yet, it is. We struggle to awake to intimacy. We work hard and still it evades us. We keep at it, and yet we hardly seem to have begun. Here again is our own great paradox. What we seek is not hidden. 
It's right here. So why don't we fully see it? Worse, why don't we fully know it and live it? If it's true, why is our world such a mess? Only the venerable Mahakashapa seems to be in on the joke. He alone cracks a smile. Everyone else, even the devas, even the gods themselves seem confused. Then Wu Men offers us a, an olive branch, a particular kindness. He acknowledges that our pitiful dullness puts us in good company. And so we have nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. Even the arhats, the bodhisattvas, and the gods were all thrown for a loop by this one little flower. And yet, there's that tail. The snake shows its tail. There's that little issue of the tail. Zen master Wu Tzu said, it's like a buffalo passing through a window. The head, horns, shoulders, and legs all pass through. Why can't the tail pass through? This is case uh, 38 of the gateless barrier. It's like a buffalo passing through a window. The head, horns, shoulders, and legs all pass through. Why can't the tail pass through? Wu Men, commenting on this case in his verse to it, writes, this tiny little tail. What a wonderful thing it is. This tiny little tail. What a wonderful thing it is. But a snake not only has a tail, a snake is a tail. Myth slides back in as Wu Men knew it must all along. A snake in Buddhist tradition can signify a wise and powerful being, a naga, a great wise serpent being. Nagas, Buddhist legend says, hold and protect the perfect wisdom, Prajna Paramita teachings among the treasures hidden in their underwater palaces. Even now, we hope that these wise beings haven't given up on us and are still selflessly guarding this wisdom for us, waiting patiently for the day when we humans will be evolved enough to receive it in full. And that old man, the golden-faced swindler, hawking his cheap goods in holding up that ordinary flower, openly showed his true identity. Nothing is hidden. The tale is revealed. So in reality, he's no swindler, but a great, wise, wisdom being. And that flower he's holding up for us all to see, why? It might actually be a very great treasure. If so, well, isn't that a terrific trick? And doesn't it just make you want to break into a smile? We'll stop here uh, and uh, we'll recite our great vows for all and uh, then we will continue sitting for a short period uh, until uh, uh, we uh, uh, will end the round and return uh, to the uh, Vermont Zendo uh, uh, since this Taisho is a bit short and uh, they may run a bit long there. We'll have a nice uh, little period of Zazen. So uh, let's recite, I'll turn this around so that we uh, face the uh, Buddha uh, and we'll recite our great vows for all. And then we will turn sideways uh, to the screen uh, and resume Zazen 
uh, to uh, for another 15 minutes or so and end the round. So give me a minute to, uh, I'll stop our recording here and uh, we will great, do our great vows for all. <laughs>